Okay. Uh, add attention. Must be or something. I don't know. Whatever. Um, <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, uh, we ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we might receive more of you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. I'd ask first that we start. We ask all uh, men who have coverings on their head to take the coverings off because this is church and that's the way it's set up so that uh, God wants nothing to come between you and God. Okay? Thank you, gentlemen. Tell that fellow next to you to take his head off. Looks good. Okay. Um, Father God, I ask that you just give us uh, each uh, this day, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, a uh, 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 more of you. More of you, more of you, more of you. That's the, uh, that's the most wonderful thing in the world, to have more of God, because God is love. So if you have more of God, you have more of? All right. And that's the deal. And who wants to have hate? See? So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for more love. More love inside of us that we can give to other people. God, the Bible says God first loved us. So we need to take his love in so that we can give it to other people. Because before we take his love in, we have nothing to give to anyone. We'll just take, 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 take. That's how I was. I was a businessman. I was take, 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 take. Get, uh, uh, just looking for advantage in all cases and trying to make a buck. And, uh, and now, because God gave me his love inside of me, I have his love to give to other people. So I'm giving now instead of taking. Today's, the title of today's message, and I'm a little <clears throat> out of, my voice is not in sync today. We, we, no one has any idea why I have, I have a hoarse voice. So uh, doctors don't know. No one knows. But we'll just keep it like that. The title of today's message is Christians are sucking. Now Christians start sucking milk and grow up eating meat. Now, there's, I'm going to correct that for you right now because I made a little error here. It should read, Christians start sucking milk and grow up chewing meat. And grow up chewing meat. And there's a difference. And we'll see that in a, in a few moments. Now, we're talking about what Christians are and what you're going to do today. All right? Okay, so we're going to read, and I have here... Uh, what we're going to be uh, uh, talking about is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I have that printed in blackface for you as one unit because uh, uh, the next place down, I start explaining and it gets kind of confusing to read. So I'll read the whole deal first in blackface. This is, comes right directly from the Bible. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And I, brethren, he's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, there were some problems in the Corinthian church. They were having lots of different problems going on, sort of like this rescue mission and every place else you go. Okay, problem, problem, problems. And so he was, in this way, correcting them. I'll start again. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. <clears throat> I have fed you with milk and not, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for, as, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? Carnal means fleshly. Yeah. Are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, one person says, I am of Paul, and, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now, it gets kind of complicated, but let's just get into the actual understanding of what God's trying to tell us <clears throat> here, and see how it applies to you. The deal is, you take the Bible, and you see how it applies to you. And if you don't see how it applies to you, you better get 
your little butt saved and born again because you got problems, okay? <laughs> All right. So, and he says now, Paul, we'll start now with the, with the actual uh, interpretation. And I, brethren, brethren, he was talking again to Christians, saved, born again, uh, children of God, could not speak unto you, uh, uh, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. That means I can't speak to you as if you're godly minded. Because he's correcting them in the church because they have all kinds of problems, divisions and stripes and everything. You know, I can't speak to you like Christians, like godly-minded people, spiritual people, uh, but as unto carnal. I have to speak to you as unto carnal. And carnal means in, in the uh, 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 Amplified Bible, he, he's saying here, uh, as non-spiritual, men of flesh. And in the, in the Greek, uh, carnal actually means fleshly, okay? Uh, non-spiritual men in the flesh in whom the carnal nature predominates. That comes from the Amplified Bible. In whom the carnal nature, the fleshly nature, predominates. Understand what that means? That's your old man who lived by the flesh. I lived for 40 some years by the flesh and now I live by the spirit. Okay, because I got saved and born again. But he's telling them, you know, guys, you guys are acting like, like uh, rigor unsaved people. Well, he's telling them, and that's what I got at this rest commission. And pretty much all other churches as well. Rush Commission is not isolated. This is just a type and shadow of churches. Very few people in churches, you know, are actually saved and born again, even though they're going maybe two or three times a week. They're not saved. They're just going because uh, some of us go, go for business reasons. Uh, that was the first. Uh, some go for, for uh, relation, finding a, a, a woman or finding a guy. There are lots of different reasons for going, but most people in churches are not saved or not born again. Very, very few are saved and actually born again, okay? Because they're carnal, okay? That was what was this problem in the Corinthian church. And then Paul says this to them. Okay, he says, but I, mean, I, I, I cannot speak to you as unto spiritual, godly minded, but as unto carnal, that's uh, where your carnal nature predominates, even as unto babes in Christ. So now, at the very least, you are babes in Christ. A babe means just a baby in Christ. That means a newborn infant, a born again. When you get born again, you are immediately a babe in Christ. What do you know? Nothing. <laughs> what do you say? Ah, uh, goo goo. Ah, uh, uh, you don't talk. You don't have nothing to say. You don't know anything. You just got saved and born again. That's a baby in Christ. After that, you start learning. How do you learn? You're be you start being fed milk. Now wait a minute. You just don't go over as a baby and go over and grab a bottle of milk and start sucking in or, or on your mother's tits and start, uh, start sucking in. You don't do that. When you're saved and born again, brand new Christian, somebody else does it for you. See? Because you don't know how. So somebody else does it for you. They teach you. They, they train you up. They, they, they tell you about God uh, about Jesus Christ. And, uh, and that's milk and they're and what they do is they give you the milk what do you do you sit right there and go yeah what do you know so you're learning a baby you know but then like all babies you pretty soon you get off the milk when you get off the milk you start getting into the meat now a newborn baby can't eat meat. You want to choke a, choke a little baby to death, you give him stuff, some meat in their mouth, and that'll be the end of them. Okay? They can't eat meat. They can't chew it. They don't know how. They don't know what it's all about. That's how you are. So if I were to come at you and say to you, for example, what is the symbolism of the tabernacle of Moses as it relates to the laws of God, I get a lot of, uh, see, that's meat. What if I, I'm going to make it very simple, what if I say Jesus loves you, God is love in the Bible, and, and, and God loves you, and it's God's will, it's God's will, this is what the Bible says, that all men be saved. That's God's will, that all men be saved. Hey, you're one of them, male or female, you're one of them he's talking about. It's God's will that all men be saved, okay? But that's a relatively simple thought, but nevertheless, it's still milk. Take it into the heavy stuff, all right? So, so he says here, I have fed you. North said, I have fed you. Because you can't feed yourself, Mel. You can't do it. You got someone's got to feed you. He says, I have fed you with milk. 
Now, I have parenthetically, I fed you with, and this is an interpretation, and soft, easily digestible, relatively effortless nourishment. The nourishment, of course, is always the Word of God, what you're taking in, all right? In other words, as a baby in Christ, when you get saved and born again, you're being fed by others because you can't feed yourself. You can't feed yourself, all right? Now, I says, he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Now, now here's a little interpretation of that. Uh, uh, meaning, uh, meat requires the intentional exertion, the chewing of the cud. Meat requires meditation for nourishment. Word of God, revelations. The nourishment's always a word from the Word of God. It's always revelations, okay? But it's it's meat require. Notice that there's something different about meat. Why? Milk equals you being fed. But the meat of the word, the meat of the word is what well, you feeding yourself. Now, when you're a Christian at the stage of you're taking in milk, which lots of people are, most Christians are doing that still, taking in milk. Now understand, God is uh, telling them the rules and regulations, and they're, they're getting a little bit here, a little bit there. Okay, all right. What, what, how do I say? I forgot where I was going to go. Oh, yes. This is, this person here being fed milk is just receiving it. So it's not intentional on their part. It's just that they're hungry. And so they, they receive, receive, they receive. It is, uh, okay. Whereas, if you take meat in, it's intentional. You see, see, here's here's the difference. You're coming to church on Sunday morning because that's a good thing to do when you're a new Christian. You come to church on Sunday morning, and you go home, and you wait a week, and you come back again next Sunday morning. Cause that's a good thing to do when you're a Christian. Okay, if you're coming to church to get fed milk. Because you don't do, what do you else do you at home? You go home, you do other things, you work this, that, or so on, but you don't study the Word of God. You don't study the Word of God. So you're coming to church every Sunday morning to get fed okay, by others. Whereas, as you hang in there and start to read the Bible yourself, and start to open the Bible on not Sunday, but Monday or Tuesday, or maybe Wednesday or Thursday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever, you're starting to feed yourself because you're going to and opening the Bible and starting to feed yourself the Word of God. That's intentional. That's what God wants because what does that show? I'll tell you what it shows. That's what it results in. Growth. Growth. You're feeding yourself. So if you come to church and listen to me every Sunday, now well, you're getting a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit of milk, and, and we're just giving it to you, and that's it. But then if you go home, now like some of these, some of the people do, do here, I know some do, they take my notes after I preach the message, they go home and they read the notes over. Now I want to tell you, if you got X amount of benefit from, from the actual preaching, 
if you go home and read the notes over, you're going to get like twice as much on your own. Because you're going to get things coming to you that you didn't think about while you were actually listening to it. Because now you can read it and see it again, and, and, you, can, and you have more information, you have to think about it, and you're going to start getting, coming to you, coming to you. In other words, what you're doing is, you come in here and get a little milk, but if you take this milk home, it becomes meat because you go over it, you go over it, you go over it, and you're showing, you're starting to show growth because now you're doing something intentional. God wants intentional. God doesn't want passive babies. Uh, feed me, feed me, feed me. I go, feed me, feed me. That's like a whiner. You know what a whiner is? I have a whiner. Oh, terrible whiners. Listen there. Uh, why, why, why? And why, why, why? Why, why, why? How come? You're, well, why don't you just go out and do it yourself? Oh, um, don't think of that. Why, 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 why? Some people want to be whiners. They just want to be fed. I want to be a baby. I want to be fed. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Very, very low-level Christians called babies in Christ. Babies in Christ. And what's God going to do with you when he gets you up to heaven? When he's got <laughs> a, a baby up there. How, how much responsibility is God going to give a baby in heaven? For example, we have, we have uh, uh, billions and billions of planets out there and star systems. And, and Jesus, Jesus Christ said, go into all the universe and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so that's an assignment we're going to do. But if you're a baby in Christ, you don't know anything about that. You don't know anything about that. You know, well, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. What's God going to do with you? Got a nice lawn here for you to mow. You can mow that lawn over there, and then you can mow this lawn, and you'll be happy. You'll be happy because you get the fullness of the Spirit according to your abilities, okay? So you're showing no ability, so he, he gives you a job that requires no ability. On the other hand, someone who studies the Word and intentionally starts chewing the cud, so to speak. You know what it is, chewing the cud? In the Bible, there are clean animals and unclean animals. Okay, Clean animals in the Old Testament. Now, there we, could, we could eat and unclean animals that we could not eat, take in. That was the Old Testament. But the difference was, well, the difference is, the clean animals could chew the cud, right? and they had split hooves. Split hoof means you're walking in two worlds. I, I, my, my, if my, my right foot is, if, I, if it's I got a split hoof, okay, then one part of it's walking, one part of my foot's walking in heaven, and one part of the, my foot's walking on the earth. I'm walking in two worlds, okay? But the animals, and, and that's, that's the claim, but you also have to chew the cud. Every animal has to chew the cud if, if we're going to be clean, all right? But only the animals who, are, who chew the cud and have split hooves are actually clean. Because there are animals out there that chew the cud that don't have split hooves. Like the camel, for example, chews the cud. Doesn't have a split hoof. It's not a clean animal. Now, split hooves, okay. and choose the... Well, what a strange thought that is. Well, God's given us that as an example of us. That's what he wants you to be. He wants you to be a clean animal from, from, from that point of view, the Old Testament point of view, a clean animal. He wants you to, to have a split, ho split hooves, and he wants you to chew the cud. Now, what does chew the cud mean? Well, what animals do they have, enough, like a cow has like four stomachs, and uh, some animals have different, different stomachs. They eat their food, and it goes into one of those stomachs, and then they regurgitate it, and it comes back up, and they chew it, and that's to chew the cud. And it winds up being a ball of maybe this size or whatever in their mouth, and they just chew it over here, and they 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 chew it over here. What does that trans translate to in, in a human being? It's meditation. It's meditation. It's thinking about what you just ate. Thinking about what you just ate. You're chewing the cud. You're meditating. You, you, you took it in. And then, then, like, for example, some of you go home and, and you know, read these things and, and uh, over again, you start chewing the cud. You start thinking about what you just heard. Think about what happened. I mean, this is, it's even easier when you go read this, but you can do it without reading it. But the point is, 
you're intentionally thinking about something. I got, I, we're coming to something that, that's uh, uh, new, new for me that, that I'll, I'll mention to you on. All right, so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm telling you is what we are and what God wants, okay? And that's the title of today's message. It shouldn't be um, Christians start sucking milk and grow up eating meat. It should be Christians start sucking milk and and grow up chewing meat. Thinking about it, like you, since, since this man came here six months ago or so, his mind's changed. Because he used to be not thinking about God. And if, if it was indeed born again, we don't know for sure whether it was or wasn't. But, but now he's thinking about the things that are happening. In other words, he went from being a baby in Christ to a, well, they go from uh, babes to adults, to adult. Babe to adult. Because he's not perhaps necessarily reviewing the notes, thinking about these things. Don't you do that sometimes during the daytime? If you're, you got to think about this now. If you're in the daytime, and something happened in the Bible, or something occurrence happened, and you're and you were thinking about it, and, you're, and all of a sudden you weren't even paying attention to it. This is Tuesday now, and this happened on Sunday, and you're doing something else, and all of a sudden it comes to mind, and you start thinking about that. Well, what that what the pastor Carell say about that chewing the cud, that that sort of stuff. That's you're starting to meditate. You're starting to meditate now. You're starting to chew the cud. That's where the real growth comes from. Chewing the cud, meditating, thinking about this. I, I have here subtitled underneath. I have when I start opening my opening, I have the rightness of our revelations depends upon the correctness of our doctrines. That's our building blocks. Under it, I've added a new thing now. Parenthetically, God is thought. God is thought. And that's there for you to think about. Well, think of it, because we all want to know what God is, don't we? We all want to know. Well, we're always trying to figure out what God is. The Bible says God is love. Okay? So we know God is love. What is love? It's emotional thought. It's thought. The Bible says God is a spirit. What is a spirit? Well, spirit's invisible. Spirit's invisible. I got a spirit inside of me. Okay? It's invisible. God is thought. And what happens is thought, in, from God's point of view, if, if you have godly thought in you, godly thought creates things new. It creates things. We don't have that quite that power altogether yet like Jesus had. But, but we do have the power to form things. In other words, we can make things. We take uh, 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 trees and cut them down and chop, chop, chop them up and then use it to make buildings and such. We form things. But we're forming things out of already existing things that are there. We have that ability now. We form things. We can't create things, though. Not physical things. We can create literature and like poetry. In fact, one of the definitions of a, uh, I, I used to be a poet actually uh, for some time. Anyway, one of the definitions of a poet is uh, of a poet is a prophet, inspired speaker. That's because why you're creating something. You're creating something new. When we get the full mind of Christ, we'll be creating. We'll be able to create things brand new, just like God. Couldn't Jesus do that? Yes, we're getting this mind of Christ, though. We're going to be able to do the same thing. So anyway, you need to think something about this. Now, what are you doing right now? You're sitting there, and what are you doing? You are thinking. Ooh, what is thought? Thought is God. Well, what's the problem here? How come I don't feel like God? Because you're thinking in terms of the world situation. Lots of us are. And not of godly things. Uh, the Bible says when we die, 
uh, I'm paraphrasing it, the soul will return to the dust from which it came from, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. The spirit will return to God. That's God's thoughts. That's what's going someplace. You're th when you you're coming out of here, you're a thought entity, a thought entity, okay, created by God. But you're fallen, okay? Because historically, now back in, uh, I'll, I'll go back all the way back in. Uh, you disagree with God, and and, and you you're you're fallen from from heaven, and God's restoring you. But it's all about thought. How did God create the heavens and the earth? By his thoughts. And he projected them, his thoughts out. He, 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 uh, uh, he breathed, the Bible would say, his thoughts out. He created the heavens and the earth. Thoughts can create things if you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And we don't have them yet, that fullness yet, but we're going to have it soon. I'm trying to give you a little bit, a little tough to kind of uh, catch on to that, but... But the point is, think about it. Because what you're thinking, you're thinking with is a defiled mind. Your mind is defiled. It's got sin in it. Okay? So you're not able to think in, ter in godly terms, okay, for the most part. But some of the thoughts that you have in your, your head are godly thoughts. And those are the ones are going to return to God who gave them. A little version there. Some of this, some of these things I can't really explain perfectly. You know, I'm just I'm kind of grasping at it myself. That, but I'm trying to. And brethren, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, uh, and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to, you were not able to bear it. He, the reason he didn't give them meat is they weren't able to bear it. That would mean you're not able to understand it. Like if I started up here, uh, get into long discussion about the tabernacle of Moses, even though I've talked to it several times to so some of you folks here, and others here have no, would have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, you're going, we're not able to bear it because you need to have a background in certain things to build up so you can understand the tabernacle. Tabernacle requires revelation from revelation from revelation from revelation. Yeah, now you understand the tabernacle. Uh, and uh, you don't have that. You can't bear it yet. So he said, that's why he said that. He said, I have fed you with milk and not meat, uh, for hitherto you were unable to bear it, that is to digest it, to grasp it, to handle it, to understand it. Neither yet now are you able to bear it. Now let's, let's look at the uh, uh, second footnote here. Uh, down in Hebrews chapter five verses twelve through fourteen. For when the time now God now he's now he's talking right to the Corinthians and talking to you. For when the time you ought to be teachers and you ought to be teachers, I got people on my staff who ought to be teachers. I mean, <laughs> for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need the one teach you again. You need to be re re taught again because you just didn't get it. Okay, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles, the fundamentals of the oracles. That's the utterances of God. And you are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. you got to start over again. You didn't get it. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful. That means in the Greek it means ignorant. Ignorant doesn't mean stupid, it just means you don't know. Okay? For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby, a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who, here it is, by reason of use, and that means by reason of habit or by, by practice, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, there's a real deal there. But strong meat belongs to them. Strong meat means understanding. Belongs to them because you have to intentionally go for it. You can't just sit back and, and be drift along and let it, uh, let it take over you. You have to go for the strong meat. You have because why? 
because you got to chew it. And then some you can just take and swallow it down. And you got strong meat, and then you're choking because you can't, can't digest it. Strong, strong meat, take it into your mouth, and then you chew it. You swallow it, maybe, and you swallow it, but it comes back up and you chew it. You have to that's meditate. You think about, think about, think about, think about, think about. And pretty soon, it starts to soften up. And then it gets it's hard at first, and it starts to soften. And then it gets softer and softer and soft. So, and so finally, it gets all soft, and you can swallow it. Strong meat. Well, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who, by reason of use, has habit practice. Notice that habit practice. How often do you read the Bible? How often do you open up these pages? If you don't open up these pages, you're not happy. <laughs> You're not, you're not getting anything. But if you are, then you're setting up a habit. Like, for example, every Sunday I preach a message here, okay? That's my, my practice, my habit. I got my habit that keeps me going, that helps me so I can get strong meat. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised. Your senses are, in the Greek, your organs of perception, your judgment, having your judgment Exercise. Exercise being trained. That's what happens when you when you lift weights, for example. It goes through. It, it's hard. You have to. I want to. I want to. I want to uh, get stronger. So what do I do? I, I got some weights over there. I just look at those weights every day. I walk over and look at those weights. That's it. Then I walk away. It doesn't happen because I'm not intentionally going after it. I have to go over and lift those weights. I have to exercise those weights. It's hard. Exercising weights is hard. It's not anything anybody enjoys, I don't think, unless you're some kind of a masochist or something. It's not, but it's hard to do that. But what happens is this. The result is you get stronger. You get stronger. But you have to intentionally do it. You can't just think about it. You've got to do it. And that's the problem with lots of people in their lives. They think about things, and then they never do them. You only got one chance here, you know. This is it. You're living your shot right now. You could die. Some of you could die tonight, tomorrow, the day after, next week. And, and I could collapse right here. This is your shot. Now is your time. You need to put aside the monkey around and show some intention. Get off the, get off the meat and get into the strong meat. Or excuse me, get off the milk and get into the strong meat. Use your, and you have to intentionally do it because nobody can do it for you. They have their senses exercised to discern. Now, why, the, why does God want us to have this? Ha, this is the big deal here now. Have their senses exercised to discern. Now, discern means to separate thoroughly to judge. And so we're having our senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's the key. That's why Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. This is a big deal. How come? They took the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and they couldn't discern the difference. To them, it was all the same thing. Just like me, before I got saved and born again, I did all kinds of things. They were against God. How come? I didn't know the difference. I just did what I felt like I wanted to do, just like most of us are right now. You just do what you want to do. Right? I don't want to be this. I don't want to do this. I don't have to do this. Yeah. One of those, I rebel against authority. Well, I learned something there. All right? I, <laughs> okay, so this, this thing about uh, discerning the difference between good and evil appears about six times in the Bible, literally. Okay? All right? And uh, it, it is the, I'm going to give you the example, and here's what I, what I was telling you about. Uh, that means this, that uh, uh, by reason of use has their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That is, to do that which Adam and, and part of him, the woman, later called Eve, were unable to do. They were not able to discern between good and evil. So they had to leave the Garden of Eden. And what's the Garden of Eden a symbol of? Heaven. Just like Satan had to leave uh Heaven. Lucifer, I should, I should say, had to leave heaven. Because he couldn't discern it either. So they couldn't discern between good and evil. 
Look at the whole deal about this thing here is that God wants us to be able to discern the difference between good and evil. There's a certain difference between... The, uh, the <laughs> now, let me give you a thought here. So when I was doing this, I had a thought. And it occurred to me that Adam and, and the woman were, were sent out of the our Garden of Eden, okay? But wait a minute now, let's look at this a little closer. So uh, what happened was, is Adam and part of him, you know, in Genesis chapter 3, the woman listened to, listened to uh, the snake, and uh, which was Lucifer, well, actually it was Satan, and, uh, uh, and uh, went against God, okay? The woman did that. But you know, her name was at, uh, just before that, in Genesis chapter 2, Adam, oh, incidentally, who named Adam, Adam? You ever ask it, you ever think about that? Well, who named Adam? Because what, what God did, he told Adam, he could give names to all the animals. Well, that's fine. So Adam, the Bible says in Genesis 2, gave names to all the animals, male and female, so forth and so on. But then you got to stop and ask yourself this. Who named Adam? Who named Adam, Adam? Bible doesn't say. <laughs> what do you think? God named Adam, Adam. And so you're, uh, when you put a name on something, you're showing a, a measure of authority over that thing because you're putting a name on that, that thing. So God put a name, Adam, on the man, showing his authority. And then God said, okay, I'm going to give you more authority. I'm going to have you name all the animals uh, in, the, in the Bible. And so Adam came up with all the names of all the animals. So Adam was putting his name, his authority on them. And God said, I want you to multiply and grow and, and subdue all, all uh, uh, how do I say, the kingdom, if you will. And so that was Genesis chapter 2. And then God said also in Genesis chapter 2, well, uh, Adam doesn't have anybody to be with. I'm just paraphrasing this now. I'm going to give him a, a mate, a helpmate for him. That's in two. And then God gave Adam the woman. Now, wait a minute. Think about this. God gave Adam, took a rib. God took a rib from Adam when he was asleep and converted it into a, a woman. Okay, let's think about that. So that's Genesis chapter three, and, and so the woman, the woman talked to uh, 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 Satan and dis disobeyed God and ate of the fruit and led Adam to do that and so on and so on, and then uh, God uh, judged uh, first the, the snake, uh, first he judged Satan, then he judged the woman, then he judged the man. And then, and then, now remember now, who ate, who ate of the apple? The woman. And then, Adam named the woman Eve. Oh, wait a minute now. So Eve didn't exist in terms of, in terms of that name. Uh, to the point when Genesis chapter three opens up, where uh, the woman's talking to the serpent and uh, and uh, and uh, and winds up eating uh, eating the fruit, okay, and she's called a woman. Now, what it was the woman at that time? She was part of Adam. Ooh, ooh, she was part of Adam. Okay, and she sinned. Okay, and led Adam to do the same thing. Eh, it's all right. all right. And then God uh, uh, cursed, actually, uh, uh, the, the serpent and, and the man and the woman. And after that, guess what Adam did? He named the woman 
Eve. After that. So Eve. What we do somebody I write this. When we talk about Adam and the woman, the woman is part of Adam, right? Well what Adam did after she was cursed and he was cursed and and they sinned, he named her Eve. That was a separation. He separated himself from her. Because when she was the woman, she was still part of him. But then he named her Eve after after the, the sin. <laughs> In other words, he separated himself from the woman. How about that? No. <laughs> so, now, and that gets involved in some other kinds of things. I, now, that's kind of like bordering on pretty heavy milk, or meat, I should say. I can get into really heavy stuff because and then we get involved in, well, Adam, uh, uh, the man Adam was named Adam while the woman was still in him. The woman was still in him when he got that name. And then the woman sinned, and Adam separated himself from the woman. And here we are today, separate from each other. And what do we want to do, really? We, we all want to uh, uh, get married, have a uh, husband, have a wife. We're separate. And we want to be restored, and we are being restored back into one again. We're being restored back into one again. That's it. Now, wait a minute. When were we one? When God created the man and then named him Adam, man and woman were one in one body. But then, God took a rib, part of Adam. There's still part of Adam, and he called the rib made made that the the, the woman. But then after she sinned, because right, she initiated a sin, after she did that, and Adam then exerted authority over her, and he separated himself from her. He named her Eve. And that's how we are now. Eve, Adam and Eve, and the Lord says we're to be restored, and we're going to be restored back into, guess what we're going to be restored back into? Into one, we're going to go back into the man's body. Because God said in Genesis, I created man, we have created man in, in our own image. In our own image. What was it? A guy. One body. And that's where we're going, we're being restored back into that one body. You know what that is? That's an example of this. That's an example of this that came to me. I started thinking about this thing. So wait a minute now, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, Adam and I got down to this point in the message and I started thinking, Adam and Eve were, well, they were just, a, it was the woman and there was even, well, and then I started to think about it. And you just heard what I what wound up thinking. Because why? Because I intentionally meditated about it, I thought about it. And I thought about it at night, and I thought about it at the daytime, and I think about it all the time, I was doing all kinds of other things. Every once in a while it would pop up and I'd think about it. I think about, I think about when I'm sleeping. I think about it. Praise God. All right. That's something for you guys to think about <laughs> right now. That's why, incidentally, the Bible says in the Bible, uh, the Bible says that uh, when we get to heaven, uh, well, it says, no, it says about the angels. The angels uh, don't marry. Of course they don't marry. <laughs> They're all one. <laughs> or they're restored back into the original shape. One. Angel was one, male and female. Now, how that works? I don't know how that works in, in the physical sense of the word. But I know how it works in the spiritual sense of the word. It's like the conscious and the subconscious psychologically. Your conscious mind and your subconscious mind, which is uh, under that, but uh, we get too involved in that. 
The psychologists are really funny to me. I, I'm a psychologist, or at least I have a degree in psychology. Yeah. Watch the thing. I'm anyway, they uh, they study all this stuff, years and years and years of study, all, all this, and, and they're all studying all this, all this, all these different this, uh, psychoses and and and, and uh, uh, you're this and that, and you have this problem, that problem, and so on. And they don't really realize they're studying the spirit. They don't really have. They don't. They don't get it. They're actually studying the spirit of God inside us, and they're studying because oh, all the stuff because we have fallen angels inside of us. Fallen angels. That's just they're looking at symptoms. Oh, you're an alcoholic. What's that mean? Well, you got this. Your mother did so and so on and so on. They don't realize. Hey, that's a dad. That's a fallen angel inside you, controlling you. So they they're looking at the symptoms and they're not looking at the reality of what I, what they're doing. In fact, if you take a good study, Freud and some of the other psychologists from 100 and some years ago were all very much involved with Christianity. Christianity. But they didn't foster that. They fostered psychology in, in its place. They tried to, they tried to interpret it uh, in, uh, spirituality in <laughs> physical terms. I'm going to just let that one slide for now. Okay. So now we talked about Adam and Eve and showed you uh, an example there. Let's go to the footnote in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And this is the Lord God speaking to Joshua, who is about to enter the promised land. And he says, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which, this is a footnote 3, that you may observe to do uh, according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. That's the Bible. That's the law. Okay, And God said this to Joshua, as he's saying this to you. He says, turn, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Don't deviate from the Bible, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. Oh, he says, prosper. He says, if you don't turn from right hand to left hand from studying the Bible, you will prosper. Let me put that up here. Prosper. Whithersoever thou goest. Then he said this, the book of the law shall not depart. That means be taken out of, the, out of thy mouth. It shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate... They're in day and night. Meditate means in Hebrew, ponder, study. When I open the Bible, I'm studying. If I'm just reading it, it's still study. Okay. And, it, and so, so what God is telling Joshua, now this is, listen, in the Bible, these ideals that, that God set up and that Jesus set up were perfection. Number one top. This is number ten. How to be perfect. Okay. Now you can't meditate day and night. You got too many. You're, st you're still trying to live an existence, existence life right here. Okay, that that goes just the opposite of that. But that's the perfection. Perfection is meditating day and night. Right? We're, we all accomplish less than that by varying degrees. Right? And what happens when if you do that, you will prosper. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do all, uh, all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Oops, said it again. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You want to be prosper, prosperous? Read the Bible. And so, uh, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have, ah, oh, look at that, good success. Hey, folks, God is telling you something right here, right today, right now. You want to be prosperous? You're all, we're all poor. We're, if some of us live under a tree someplace. We're, you're worried about where you're going to get your next meal, where your job's going to come from, or this person, that person, all these problems going on here, okay? You want to be prosperous instead? Scott, for example, who's going to be a bum the rest of his life unless he gets his act together back there, all right? Going to be same thing over and over and over and over. Need this, need this, help, 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 help. Why? Huh? No intentional looking into the Bible. Nothing. 
Can't be prosperous. Can't have, what do I say here? On here. Good. Success. Prosper, prosperous, good success. You know why? Read the Bible. Don't be a dummy. You don't like the way you're living now? You don't like the things that are going on in your life? Fine. You don't have to worry about it. If you start reading the Bible because God says, cast your cares upon me for I care for you, he'll take care of you. Oh, well, I don't believe that. Well, then suffer, baby. Hey, your problem, not mine. We told you, that's the deal. You don't believe it? Okay, you see, well, God's a liar and all this stuff is a bunch of garbage. Hey, don't even bother coming to church then. Just forget it. Go your own way. See where that gets you. That's what you've been doing all your life. You've been going your own way. God says, go my way and you will be prosperous. You will prosper. You'll have, you'll be prosperous. You'll have good success. Got a liar? I did that. I turned. I started reading the Bible and I'm, I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. That's what prosperous means. Happy. That's what blessed means. Happy. In the Hebrew, it means happy, happy, happy. You can be happy too. You don't have to be a bum. Unless you choose to be. Too lazy to put, uh, 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 you want, <laughs> you're too lazy to, to feed yourself. The best you can ever have, hope to have is milk. Milk of the word. That's it. And no meat. Go some other place. Hey, I got people come to church here all the time, and they come once or twice, and then they go someplace else. How come? Well, this isn't what they're really looking for. Because they go someplace else, they can interact with other people, and they can do this, they have friends over there, and so on and so on, and all these other exterior things to be in a church. So they're just looking for exterior things to make them happy and their family happy. I got people who come, uh, well, who, wants to, who wants to bring their kids to a rescue mission church? Well, I'm uh, I'm a person uh, and uh, established in society. I'm I'm somebody. I, I take my my people to a big church, big big church where we can see the big people of the community and they can see us. And what? Where's God? <laughs> right here, right here, right here. Right. I have another guy just recently left us. He he mentioned to me that now he's going to uh, now he's going to a real church. He has a building. It's a real church. I like, ah, oh, a real, what are you talking about? You see, that's where his mind is. Where's his mind? In people and things and coverings and, and buildings and, and stuff. And not here. Okay, and, and, and thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Dismayed means be all broken up. Okay, for the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. Notice that. What I say, for the Lord thy God is with thee. Notice again, for the Lord thy God is with thee. E. I don't want that. I just, uh, I just gonna, you know, float around and do my thing. Ah, <laughs> okay. Well, you can float right, you know where you're headed then. Fourth footnote, Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed, that in the Hebrew means happy, means prosperous. That's what it means. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord. For his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's this. Okay. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Again, meditate. That's the perfection again. No, we can't meditate day and night. Are we? None that except Jesus could do that. But that's, that's the goal. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth, what? Shall prosper. 
I'll get the runner. So I got listening to Senator Brown's Rescue Mission. I got a bunch of people coming. They're all poor. Everybody here is poor, okay? And all this, that, and we do this, that sort of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wine, 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 wine. Hey, don't whine to me. <laughs> Read the Bible. Now, I can't tell them that. They come in, they're all broken up. And, 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 and I, can, I can suggest it in a nice way. I'm letting you know it flat out, tell you the deal. If you're, if you're whining and you're a whiner, hey, don't tell me about that. That's your problem. You just aren't doing what God said you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be prosperous. But you can't be prosperous without being in that book. And I know people who are millionaires and multimillionaires, and they're, they're in the world prosperous, but, man, are they miserable. Miserable, miserable people. So let's go now to the fifth footnote. John chapter 16, verses 12 to 13. This is how. This is how again. I, this is Jesus speaking, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's talking to his disciples. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them because Jesus Christ had not yet been crucified on the cross. So he still had the Holy Spirit in him. It wasn't in his disciples. Okay. So he's talking to his disciples. So he said, but you cannot bear them. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now because you need the Holy Spirit to be, to be able to do that. Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all things, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. What does that mean, hear? That means, you notice, know, Jesus wrote this, uh, said this 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the Bible was an oral tradition. It was oral. Yes, there were little scraps, pieces written around here and there and so on and so on, but it was an oral, it was 99.9% .9 an oral tradition. It was here, 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 here. And in 1611, when the King James Version was published, it became a written tradition then. But up until 1611, where the King James Version was published, it was an oral tradition. So that's why this Bible says here, and whatsoever he shall hear, because that's what you're doing here. Uh, uh, but whatsoever, whatsoever he, that's the Holy Spirit, shall hear, that shall he speak. And he don't hear nothing unless you read it to him. This is what he has to hear. And if he hears this, then... He'll interpret it for you. He'll interpret it for you. He'll give you the revelation. But you have to have this in you for him to do it. He can't give you a revelation of something you never, uh, uh, like the source of the seed. If you've never heard about the source of the seed, he's not going to give you a revelation about the source of the seed. He can't because you don't have it in you. You've got to get this in you. It's called prosperity. You've got to become prosperous. You've got to become happy. You've got to become blessed. You've got to obey the Lord. And he will show you things to come. That's prophecy. Here's Jesus saying, the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. This is true. It's what he does. That's prophecy. Now let me go to the, the backup on that, that particular thing. This is footnote A from 1 John chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Oh, wait a minute now. Now we're going to run to problems. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. What does seduce mean? Footnote I underneath that says this. Seduce means to cause to roam, to cause you to roam, to cause you to roam away from the truth, okay? Roam from safety, roam from, roam from truth, roam from virtue. To cause you to go astray, to deceive you, to err you, to wander, to make you to wander, to be out of the way. To be, make you out of the way. Out of what way? On the way to God. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing, oh, wait a minute now. Now we're talking about an anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. 
anointing. What does that mean? Now look at the second footnote underneath there, anointing. The anointing in the Greek is charisma. That's the, that's the Greek word, okay? It means smearing. In the Old Testament, they used to anoint the priests by smearing oil on them. The starting on the head, all the way down, all over their clothes and everything about them. That was an anointing in the Old Testament, okay? In the New Testament, the anointing is not outside you. In the New Testament, it's inside you. Now, we're not anointed on the outside. We're anointed on the inside. Praise God. Praise God. By the presence of the Holy Spirit comes into us on the inside. Okay? Now, anointing means the shrewing, especially the, the special endowment, the charism uh, of the Holy Spirit. Now, howbeit, when the, he, the Spirit of truth, is come, when you get saved and born again, he will guide you into all truth, and, 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 for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Praise God. Prophecy. Prophecy. Back page. Commentary. It says here, oh, let me go back up to the front page again for our text. Um, we left off, neither are you, are you uh, uh, in the middle of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it goes down to here, go down to, uh, for ye are yet carnal. Uh, he said this, I, was, uh, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Uh, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And here we start again. For ye are yet carnal. He's talking to the people in the church again. So you're yet carnal. That's predominantly carnal. And you are predominantly carnal. But we all are predominantly carnal. To varying degrees. Predominantly mean fleshly. We live according to this world. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. And man, we got it here. Envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not yet carnal? Because you shouldn't have those. You should have peace, love, understanding. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as men. Now let's go to the back footnote on this. And walk as men. You walk as men. You walk as unnatural, or work as natural, unsaved men. You are all Christians, and, and we go, we, <laughs> and we still walk as unsaved men. We don't walk as Christians. What's it say here? Commentary number six. Walk as men. You walk as men. That is, you walk as earthly men versus the heavenly angels that you actually are. You are all fallen angels. You've been separated from God. Okay? And he wants to restore you. And you're walking as earthly men versus the heavenly angels that you actually are. And the Amplified Bible has it. Behaving yourselves after a human standard like mere unchanged men. Unch you're acting, even though you're Christians and born again, you still act like unsaved guys and girls. What's the deal? Going back over again. For yet carnal, for as where as there is among you envy and, st and strife and divisions, are not yet carnal and walk, and walk as men. For while one saith, I am, and that's a follower, student, and learner of Paul, and another, I am a follower, student, and learner of Apollos, are you not carnal? Because you should be saying that of Jesus Christ instead. Because these are earthly men. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom, of Jesus Christ by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Let me go to footnote 7 in the back. Ministers. What is a minister? And you're all ministers. Every one of you who is saved in the morning again is an ordained minister. Greek. It means to run on errands. Oh, well, I'm, I'm a minister. I'm a somebody. I'm big shot. No, what's it say? God's ministers are these. To run on errands. An attendant. Generally a waiter. At a table or other menial duties. Specifically a Christian teacher and pastor. A servant. We're servants. 
we're not the big shot calling the shots here. We're servants. Jesus Christ calls the shots. Let me run this by. Oh, it says you're the last one up there. Uh, by whom he believed. Even as the Lord, last, last of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 reads, even as the Lord gave to every man. What did the Lord give to every man? Turn, turn over to 8. Romans 12, 3. The Lord gave to every man this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think more highly of himself, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, that is, be of sound mind, be sane, be in right mind. That's in the Greek, okay? But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, wait a minute. Does it say a measure of faith or the measure of faith? It says the measure. The difference is this. If it's an A measure of faith, you could have five over here, of if we were cognitive like that, five and ten over here, and fifteen and fifty and three and two and one, and that's A measure, that's A measure, oh, that's a measure, that's a measure, okay? But I didn't say the A measure, it said the measure. That means this, every one of you got the same measure of faith when you got saved and born again. Bingo! Every single one of you got exactly the same, and me, got exactly the same measure of faith when we got saved, when we got born again. Exactly so. But, well, I want to mention this to you. For those of us who then started to be intentional feeding yourselves the meat, okay, one of the gifts of the Spirit is, nine gifts of the Holy Spirit is faith. One of the, so there's more faith. You can get more faith. But you all start the same. But you can get more faith. Now, let me let me give you some example here, here of, of the measure of faith. A commentary exemplify this commentary. Uh, uh, to think more soberly is exemplified by the demon possessed man of the Gardenese, who was saved and thereafter found it to be in his right mind. That's a quote, because he was out of his mind. And what God is telling us is, you, you're not in your right mind. <laughs> <laughs> Getting your right mind, and there's a, a second example would be uh, uh, that was a the demon, demon, demon possessed man. He had six thousand demons. This guy had, and God saved him. Uh, Jesus saved him, and he wound up being in his right mind. Mark chapter five, five verse fifteen and Luke five uh, Luke eight thirty five, and the other example is the prodigal son. Remember him? The guy was up in heaven, uh, uh, figuratively, and, and left heaven and came down and spent all, everything God gave him on wine, woman, and song. And when he was broke, he finally got, came to himself. He had to go to the bottom, though. Many of you got to go to the bottom before you get saved. You, got, you, got, you know the best place to get people saved in the hospital, especially when if they're dying. Oh, man, that's a different deal then. Hey, I'm at the bottom now. I'm dying. Yeah, I'll think about Jesus Christ. Tell me about Jesus Christ. How many people do you think get saved who are dying? Because <laughs> they're at the bottom, you see. Are you at the bottom yet? Have you hit the bottom? Because God will save you. That was in Luke chapter 15, verse 17. So I don't know. I do know. I do know that that was good, because I enjoyed that. And God uh, helped me through that, and... and uh, so the reason we meet here on Sundays is I give you what you're willing to receive. Just like Jesus, when he spoke a parable, gave the people what they were willing to receive. Some people get a little bit of this and that. Okay? And some people get a lot. And some people don't get anything. And that's what we do here every Sunday. I give out the milk of the word, and I definitely give out the meat of the word. But you've got to be 
have had the milk for some time before it can, can mature into the meat. But the meat, the people who get the meat are the ones who intentionally seek the Lord themselves. You have to intentionally seek the Lord. And how's that? How do you do that? You open that book and you start reading it. So, Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What I'm showing you here is the kingdom of God today. Because some of you, it's starting to make a little bit of sense. Some of you made a lot of sense, some a little bit of sense, some no sense. Okay, But you can all understand it. You can all come into this kind of an understanding and you start by asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life and be the Lord of your life. And then what he does, he sends his spirit, his Holy Spirit, into your heart to explain to you this. But you have to take this in. You can't just get saved and say, that's it, I'm done, and I'm going to heaven and walk away because that may not be happening. You've got to take this in. Intentionally. So I ask now first, is there anybody here today who would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'll say a little, little a prayer and you can say it after me. Anyone at all? Please raise your hand and we'll say a prayer for you. Yes, sir. One. Anybody else? Anybody else like to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Anybody else? Okay. Please stand. What's your name? Jameson Pentecost. Well, that's a good name. Thank you. <laughs> I have to think about that. <laughs> um, all right, come on up here with me. Sure. Okay, I want to turn around, face. See, this is like, and you actually are, and I'm telling you this now, and it's, it's difficult to understand. This is meat, I'm telling you, but you are angels. You are actually fallen angels. I can show that to you if you go back to my January messages and continue forward from there. But you're fallen angels. Being, God has given me the opportunity to be redeemed, to be restored back to your heavenly state in heaven. That's what the restoration is all about. Being restored back into what you used to be before you disobeyed God. And so I ask now, anyone here, I want to say this prayer for... Uh, Jameson, and if anyone would like to say this with me, you can act like a chorus of heavenly angels, escorting him to the door. He'll walk through it on his own. But let's all please stand and say, say this prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, Jameson, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all your sins? Yes, I do. All right, good. Please repeat this prayer after me, and you folks along with us. And remember now, when you say this prayer, the Bible says uh, the angels rejoice over one sinner that repents. And that means they're all around you as well, okay? Angels are spirits, they're invisible, but they're here. Let's say this now, shall we? Father God, Father God I, confess I'm a I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died, on the cross died on the cross and paid the penalty for all my sins, and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Father God, please send your Son, your seed, your fire, your love, into my heart. To be my Lord and Savior. To be my, to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you. Please be seated. Please be seated. God bless you, sir. Thank you. You have a Bible? I do not, sir. I'll get you one later on. I'm much obliged. I'll take okay. it. Good. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, okay. Now we're gonna uh, have a meal. First, I want to thank the Lord God for this wonderful message that that I. Oh yes, I forgot. Got it. <laughs> First. First, even before that, thank you.
Yes, I want you to come up and fuck your ties. On the other side. Yeah, or you can't. You got your bad foot. Can you go on the other side? Yeah, just pass it. Pass it back and forth. I got another, another guy on the other side as well. Yeah. Okay. You stand over there. Obedience. The reason we take the tithes is not for your money. <laughs> it's to show you something about yourself. That's what everything is about, about you. It is to show you whether you're being obedient or not to the Lord. He said, return to me. That means that the assumption is he gave you everything that you have, and he asked you to return to him 10% of your increase, of your increase. If you made $10 this week, then the Lord will ask you to put a dollar in it Tithe bucket, 10%. Okay? If you do that, he said, I will open the windows of heaven above you so that you will not be able to contain the blessings that will flow down upon you. Okay? It seems to me that's a pretty good deal. Okay? Now, as far as he says, he says another thing uh, for those who, who don't tithe. He, uh, uh, this is in Malachi. And this is a quote he said, Would you rob God? And, and and the people said, well, what do you mean rob God? And, and, and he said, in tithes and offerings, you've robbed me. You've taken from, I'm paraphrasing now, from my storehouse. You have robbed me. In other words, you save some with compassion and some with fear from Jude. All right? He wants you to know whether you're being obedient to him or not. If you think this is just a joke and you're not obedient and you're just waiting to get a meal, and that's okay with me. Hey, that's your problem. You're making your own life what it wants to be. You know, right there, uh, 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 right on the board is your life. All right? I'm just telling you, I'm going to heaven when I die. I know I'm going to heaven. You can go, too. Everybody can go who wants to go. Just have to obey God. He doesn't want any disobedient children. There's no such thing as disobedient children in heaven. They've all been trained nicely. They're all very obedient, and they're serving the Lord. Out into all the universe, we're serving the Lord. On the other hand, you don't have to go to heaven. You can go to hell if you want to. Up to you. Just don't do anything. You'll go to hell and you slide right down there. Where you want to be. Okay. I'm going to bless this. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for the word today. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your understanding. I know, Lord, that your word does not return to you void. And there must have been some understanding to come out of that. And Lord, I thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and the Savior. I ask that you bless everyone here with more of you. Amen. Amen. Tim, want to bless the food we're about to partake of? Amen. God bless God. Hallelujah. Thank you.